go. Boston traffic sucks. Sucks really bad. We're gonna fix that with data, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Hey gang, how's it going? Mass MEP 2023, we're at Polar Park in Worcester, Massachusetts, day three of our trip to the Northeast. On Wednesday, we were at PTC Liveworks. We had fellowship deep dives with PTC and Kepware. We talked to you guys about Kepware Plus. Yesterday, we were on site with Tulip all day long. Our friends from HiBite came down. We have five or six hours of fellowship and a deep dive on the platforms, strategic partnerships, the future of uh, IIoT platforms in the United States. Today, I'm giving the keynote address at MassMEP, Smart Factoring, the Steps to Success. Today will be a success if everyone walks away understanding that data will be the primary commodity of the manufacturer of the future. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. Are you excited? Uh, I am never actually excited for any of these. I'm just zen. Zen? Yeah, getting in the flow. Um, I'm actually visualizing my bullet points and I don't generally use PowerPoint slides. You know that that's grounds for immediate termination in my companies, but uh, I'm visualizing my slides. But yeah, no, it's Zen. I mean, I just speak from the heart anyway. I think the mistake a lot of people make when they're speaking publicly is they think about what they're saying. Mm -hmm. What they need to do is, honestly, what you do is you wanna speak emotionally. My mom told me that when I was in the seventh grade. She's like, like truly believe what you're gonna say and then just speak from the heart. So it's more like having a conversation with people. You know? Even if it's a call to action or a speech to educate, or you're still doing the same thing. Hey, yo. Tell me a little bit about Mass MEP, the 30 second elevator pitch. About who we are? Yeah, I, I know you, but I want to hear what, what you guys say about a mass MEP. What we do? Yes. My pitch is always that we work with all the manufacturers in the state of Massachusetts to help them sustain and grow their businesses. Right. We don't want them leaving. We want them to stay here for the Massachusetts infrastructure. Uh, we connect with them on all levels, whether it's, you know, if they're an incubator um, and they're just starting out, if they're a startup and getting them connected to another manufacturer or if it's a manufacturer, lean, continuous improvement, uh, looking to get themselves a little bit better and stronger okay. in what they're doing. Yeah. So anything we can do to help the manufacturer so there's no cash flow out of their pocket, okay. that's what we try to do with them to got make it. that work. I'm actually gonna completely wing this. Okay, so I learned some stuff when I got here that I didn't know before I got here. So most of the audience are small manufacturers. So I'm gonna start by asking three questions, all right? Hope to hopefully illustrate my action item, which is you need a digital strategy, okay? So we're gonna start with, if you work for a manufacturer, how many of you have a digital strategy statement? And before you raise your hand, if you raise your hand, you will have to recite the digital strategy statement to me, okay? Number one, I've, I've been on the front lines with the most advanced organizations in the world, okay? So there's always this, this adage I say to people when you're gonna speak, there are four questions you need to ask. Question number one is, why should anyone listen to you? Right? There's a lot of people who talk who are wasting people's time. Uh, to Tim's point here, there are a lot of brilliant academics out there. These three questions, I'm going to show you that academics have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to manufacturing. And intellectuals have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to manufacturing. And these three questions will prove my point. So number one, who here has a digital strategy statement? None of you. Not a single person has a digital strategy statement. Three sentences, why we want to be digital. Why data is going to be our primary commodity in our business. No one. Question number two, who here is confused by what digital transformation or industry 4.0 or smart manufacturing means for your business, how to do it? Who is here confused? Okay. And it's more than that. For those of you who didn't, you, right here. How, how does digital transformation, industry 4.0, and smart manufacturing work for your business? What do you do? I just got recruited by Rockwell to um, Okay, so how does Rockwell Automation, I'm very hard on Rockwell, by the way. 
<laughs> I'm very, very hard on Rockwell. Um, how does Rockwell believe smart manufacturing, industry 4.0, and digital transformation can help these small manufacturers here in the Northeast? By increasing the quality of the product that's coming out the door, by increasing the, um, the on-time shipments, by giving you accurate data so you can make informed decisions. Okay, so increasing, increasing quality of the product going out the door, giving you insights so you can make more accurate decisions. Where do they start? And this is the question no one can ever answer, which is my third question to you. Where do you start? Who here knows where to start? All right, that's how good academics and intellectuals are at conveying concepts and ideas to frontline workers in the United States. So I'll tell you a little bit about me. I grew up in Ithaca. I still have a summer home there. Um, and I grew up there in the 80s when Smith Corona was still there and IBM was still there and Kodak wasn't a joke. Kodak is a punchline, right? When we talk about Kodak, what do we say about Kodak? What's the joke? They owned the original digital camera technology and their CEO said, no one's going to give up film for digital. Right? How did that play out? If I had gone into that boardroom in 19, I believe 78 is the year, but if I had gone into that boardroom and told him he was an idiot, I would have been right. And then he would have kicked me out of the room. Right? So I grew up in upstate New York when manufacturing the mass exodus. And I was told the same thing that everyone else heard, which is it was corporate greed that drove jobs out of the Northeast for cheap labor. Right? They just want to pad the bottom line. So I grew up dirt poor in a trailer park. All my friends, their families went from middle class to working in gas stations. And I literally watched that over an eight year period when I was in middle school and high school. And I, sure, I assure you, many of you have seen the same thing. Why? Because today only 10% of Massachusetts economy comes from manufacturing and only 7% of the workforce is in manufacturing. Do you know what it was in 1950? It was half and half. It was 50-50. Today it's 10 and 7. Okay? And the reasons are the exact same reasons we saw in upstate New York. And then I learned when I was studying sociology why it is that American manufacturing left the United States. And it wasn't corporate greed. So in 1969, the third industrial revolution started. Does everybody know what the third industrial revolution is? Does everybody know what the first one was? Steam engine. Steam engine. The second one was the assembly line. The third one was automation in 1969. The first PLC came out in 69. And the fourth industrial revolution started in the year 1998 when TCP IP won the protocol wars. And for those of you who don't know anything about networks, TCP IP is basically what ethernet runs on. So the moment we could put a cat six cable into a switch, the fourth industrial revolution started. And the fourth industrial revolution follows the third industrial revolution, which was all about the automation of industrial processes. The third industrial revolution, PLCs, those things that run all your equipment, they were invented in 1969, and some companies adopted them right away. And they happened to be in Japan and Germany. We did not. American companies did not adopt automation quickly enough. And by the late 1970s, we could no longer compete. So in order for companies to stay viable and to buy themselves time, they had to go find cheap labor. So when I was studying sociology at State, the first thing I thought was, you know, Moore's Law says that every technological revolution is going to take half as long and cost half as much. So the first industrial revolution was the steam engine, late 18th century. The second industrial revolution was at the very end of the 19th century. The third industrial revolution was midway in the 20th century. And the fourth industrial revolution was three quarters of the way through the 20th century. Okay? The fifth industrial revolution has started. And some of you are still operating on technology that you got from the third industrial revolution. And you haven't even started the automation of your business processes which is what the fourth industrial revolution is all about. But I learned, you know what? The fourth industrial revolution is going to start. 
And if I get a head start on it, I can help American manufacturers do to the Japanese and the Germans what they did to us in the late 1970s. And so that's what my whole life has been dedicated to, revitalizing manufacturing in the United States, saving and creating middle class jobs. I have 49 companies. Every single one of my companies have the exact same mission, save and create middle class jobs in the United States. And we do that by teaching organizations how to use technology to do more with less. It's that simple. Today what I'm going to talk about, because it's mostly small mom and pops here, I'm going to talk about some of the great things about Tesla and Amazon. We're going to start with that conversation. Okay. Hopefully everybody walks out of here and they say to themselves, in eight weeks or less, we are going to have a digital strategy statement. If I were to come back, I'm going to be back here in September to speak at Tulip, to do a keynote at Tulip. And I would love for all of you to come to that event. And I would love to open up my keynote by asking everyone in the room who has a digital strategy statement and every person here raise their hand. That would be, that would be a win. Okay? That would be a win. All right, so let's see what we got here. All right, manufacturing is really actually quite simple. So what manufacturing is, is very, very simple. Right? Doing manufacturing is really, really hard. But manufacturing, in a nutshell, is nothing more than I sell stuff, I plan to manufacture the stuff, I execute the manufacturing of that stuff, I monitor my facility, I monitor my machines, I put stuff in inventory, I ship it, I get paid, and I pay my bills, and then I do it all over again. That's manufacturing. The reference to ERP, which is the plan to, sell, plan to manufacture stuff, why is it that ERP wasn't the saving grace everyone said it was going to be? And the answer is, is because it's financially driven, it's driven by accountants, it's driven by general ledger, and accountants don't run your business. Who here thinks that you are the smartest person in your organization? Or your board of directors are the smartest people in your organization? Or your senior executives are the smartest people in your organization? Who are the smartest people in your organization? Not the, board. The, the, the shop floor, the operators. Okay. They didn't go to the same school you went to. They didn't read Carnegie. They haven't read Good to Great. They don't know who Jim Collins is. Okay. They don't give a shit if you like them or not. Okay. I worked for Borg Warner Automotive, so I did four manufacturing stints. My whole goal was to learn manufacturing. Ten years, I'll learn manufacturing. Then I'll become an integrator and I'll teach people how to transform their organizations. So I intentionally worked for four different types of man manufacturers. Number one, heavy industry at Cargill de-icing. I worked in a salt mine. I started out shoveling belts and then I became an electrician. And while I was getting my master's in education and studying to become an electrical engineer, I worked on equipment. I learned what three-phase electricity was. I, I, I learned what a CMMS was. I learned what IBM Maximo did. I learned all the things about maintenance working in heavy industry. And then I went to printing, and I'm going to tell a printing story today. And for a year and a half, I worked on a high-speed, dirty process, high, lots of motion control, to figure out what do organizations who have to deal with high-speed, dirty processes with lots of motion control deal with. <coughs> and then I went to the steel industry. I went to Nucor Steel, and I worked for Nucor Steel for five years in Auburn, New York. And then we, I took the same digital infrastructure I put at Nucor Steel, and we deployed it to Darlington, South Carolina. And my last stop was at Borg Warner Automotive, a tier one automotive supplier, the only union facility I worked in. So I was an engineer for, for Borg Warner Automotive. We were gonna have a strike, so I was a company guy. I was in a room about this big. We were doing all the management plans for the strike, okay? So the UAW was gonna go out, they were gonna go on strike for however long, negotiating better salary. And our general manager said that we were gonna run the equipment. So they're like, hey, you know, you, you, everybody's going to be assigned to a certain manufacturing sector. Some people are going to run assembly machines. Some people are going to work in extrusion. Some people are going to work in uh, the, the stamping area. And I'm like looking around at the people in this room, in the room, and I'm thinking, what the fuck is this guy talking about? <laughs> like, do we honestly believe that I, I'm a smart guy, but do you really think I can go out and replace a guy who's been working on an assembly machine for 25 years and knows every nuance of every sound on that piece of equipment? Do you really think I can do it? Like, I literally raised my hand. 
I said, this is preposterous. Like, we're going to break everything. And we're going to produce nothing. Do we really think our operators are that dumb? That they're just monkeys? Over the course of my entire career, do you know who my best friends were in manufacturing? They were the operators. Do you know why? Because as an electrician, as a mechanic, as an engineer, they could make my job five minutes or five hours. They already knew what the problem was. They already knew what the problem was. And they didn't know just what the problem was on the machine. They knew what the problem was with the business. They could tell you what management was doing wrong. They could tell you what was wrong with the workflows. They could tell you wrong with what was wrong with the systems that everyone was buying. You guys have all heard this term, right? The flavor of the month, right? Executives in the, in the board of directors, the senior executives who spend most of their time in the boardroom, they come up with these grand ideas to transform businesses. And why is it they don't take, why is it none of you have a digital strategy? Why is it all of you are confused by digital transformation? Because you're going about it all wrong. You know what digital transformation is? It's really quite simple. It is the process of transforming your company into a uh, digital infrastructure that makes data the primary commodity in your business. That's it. Doesn't matter what you make. Doesn't matter who your customers are. Data becomes your primary commodity. Does anybody disagree with me that that is the path to the future? And if you do, I want you to raise your hand. I mean, I'm, I'm going to call on you, but I want you to raise your hand. OK, good. Does anyone know where to start? All right. I assure you, by the end of this presentation, you will know where to start. All right, buzzwords. We're going to go through these real quick. Digital transformation, real simple. It is the process of going from where you are right now to a place where data becomes your primary commodity. Okay? Industry 4.0 scares the shit out of everybody. And sorry for the language. They do know what I'm like. I did ask. You guys do know my style. Okay. Um, Industry 4.0, it means two things. In the United States, it means the fourth industrial revolution. In Europe, it's a standard for transforming. It just so happens that that standard wasn't worth the paper it was written on. Why? Because it was written by academics and intellectuals. In, in the European Union, they believe that Industry 4.0 starts with computerization, that the first step is computerization. It is, it is not. The first step is education. Everybody in here is accomplished. You're all educated. Every single one of you has a long list of accomplishments. Here's why I'm awesome in this industry. And none of you know how to start to digitally transform. Education is the first step, I promise you. Okay? Fourth Industrial Revolution, I've already explained. IIoT, it's the Industrial Internet of Things. All that means is take all the smart things in your business and connect them together, and you have an Industrial Internet of Things. Okay? Um, what is a smart thing? It has connectivity, it can connect into a network, and it can tell you something about itself. It's that simple. Human beings are smart things. This is a very, very important part. Human beings are one of the things in your IIoT infrastructure. Uh, ITOT convergence, very simple. You have two areas in your business. One is carpeted, and everybody wears collared shirts. And one is made of concrete, and they wear blue shirts. Uh, the latter is OT, and the former is IT. Okay? There are two different uh, network worlds in your manufacturing facility. One on the plant floor, and run up one on the carpeted side. ITOT convergence is connecting those two together. It's that simple. What is the challenge in doing that? IT is the challenge. Okay? And I'm going to show you how you can measure your digital maturity. Like, where am I? Like, did we, uh, did we just get lucky and we're halfway there? Or have we not even started? And I'm going to show you how it is we measure that. Okay? Why are Tesla and Amazon awesome? Let's start with Tesla. Why is Tesla? First off, does everybody agree Tesla is awesome? Or are there any haters in here? I assure you, Tesla's fucking awesome. Uh, they're awesome. <laughs> they're awesome. OK? Uh, here's why Tesla's awesome. I mean, here's a, a fascinating statistic. And I'm going to show you this in digital maturity. 
Do you know that ev after every year that passes, Tesla advances five years on their competitors? So every year, they get five years of growth on their competitors. How do they do that? The answer is they solve problems in two to four week cycles when their competitors are solving them in six to 10 week cycles. It takes six to 10 weeks to do a project in a manufacturing environment. It may take six to 12 months if you're a really, really slow bureaucratic organization. Tesla does it in two to four weeks. Whole solutions. And how do they do that? They created one common digital infrastructure upon which they solve all their problems. Amazon did the same thing. In 2002, Jeff Bezos sent a very famous email to all of his employees. Has, that, has anybody read this email? I know Henry has, and I know anybody who watches our content on YouTube has probably read this, this email. In 2002, Jeff Bezos sent an email at about 2 o'clock in the morning. You can Google it and read it. I'll summarize it here. He said, we share entirely too much data in this organization manually. Too many spreadsheets, too many emails, too many phone calls, too many people walking from their desk to someone else's desk. If you do that starting tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., you'll be fired. Starting tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., you will build services and you will serve all data and information over a common infrastructure. They turned over 11% of their workforce in the next 18 months, firing people who broke those rules. That turned into Amazon Web Services. Do you know what Amazon Web Services does for Amazon? Who here uses Amazon? Everybody, don't lie, okay? Do you know how Amazon gets you anything you want to your front door within 48 hours for the best price? How do they do that? Let's get all these smart people in here. If I were to task you with a function, and the function would be we're gonna serve a market, and that market's gonna be the entire United States, and our standards for success are going to be you're gonna deliver any product that anyone wants to 99% of Americans in 48 hours or less, how would you achieve that? Yell it out, how would you do it? Brainstorm. Eliminate waste. Eliminate waste. How would you get the stuff to them? You're gonna use FedEx? You're gonna use, the po you're not gonna use the Postal Service, come on, let's be honest. <laughs> you're not gonna get it in 48 hours or less. Where are you gonna put everything? Are you gonna build 100,000 distribution centers and stock every item known to humanity just in case somebody's gonna buy it? How are you gonna do it? Does anyone know how Amazon does it? Henry, I know you know. But does anyone know how Amazon actually achieves that? This is how good academics, by the way, and intellectuals are at teaching you what digital transformation is. Because you should know. Amazon predicts what you're going to buy 60 days before you buy it. Anybody's mind blown yet? How do they do that? OK. They do it the same way you're gonna solve your traffic problems here in Boston. By the way, I have been in 99 countries. I have been, you name any city, I've been there. Boston has the worst traffic. It is not even close than any other city I've ever been in, in my life. Why is traffic bad in Boston? Do you, do you have enough roads? Yes, you have enough roads. Are there too many people on the roads? No, there are not too many people on the roads. It's the people, it's the human behavior. Um, you know, we were taking the tunnel from Logan and it goes from, I think, four lanes to three lanes to two lanes when you go through the tunnel, right? So obviously that's a civil engineer's nightmare. I mean, any civil engineer would be like, oh my goodness. Is it possible to go through that tunnel without ever having to stop? Is it possible that if everyone behaved in a certain way, no one would ever have to stop? Yes. Do you know why full self-driving exists? Why Tesla developed full self-driving? To solve that problem. Also to save lives. I have a Tesla Model S, Jared has a Model 3. I use full self-driving in Dallas all day long. It drives me to work, drives me home. I have to intervene for maybe once every two hours. I've got to intervene, like maybe in a construction area or something like that. Full self-driving is absolutely profound. And Tesla tracks you. Does anybody have a Tesla? Okay, so Tesla has track, gives you a safety score, okay? And it, 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 it measures you across eight metrics as to how safe you are as a driver. 
I'm a safer driver when I use full self-driving. My safety score goes way up. I'm about a 90 when I have control, and I'm a 98 when the car drives itself. Okay? The problem with your traffic are all the people who stay in the right lane as long as they possibly can to move three cars ahead. Okay? If everybody alternated and a mile before we merged into three lanes and two lanes, you could keep traffic moving at a steady pace. Right? Everybody talks about ESG and sustainability. You know, it's great. You're up here in the Northeast, everyone cares about the environment, but the biggest mistake you're making when it re relates to environment is not solving your traffic problem. Data will do that. How do you know where the potholes are? How do you know which potholes to fix? How do you know whether or not to put a traffic light there or not put a traffic light there? You know, you have civil engineers that put roundabouts in places roundabouts shouldn't be. Data will tell you whether or not a roundabout makes sense. In industry, you guys will invest in technology. HMIs, has anybody got fancy HMIs on their equipment? You know, little touch screens, right? How do you know that that HMI provides value for your business? Which of those screens do your operators use the most? In which order do they navigate through their HMIs? How do you know which reports that you spent $10,000 on some consultant to write are actually used in the business? The answer is you don't, because you don't track that data, because you're not digital. Okay? Tesla is awesome because Tesla did two things. Number one, they started with a digital strategy. They have transformative and disruptive leadership. Everything you hear in the media about Elon Musk is untrue. He is an alien from the future, he is the smartest guy in every single room, and he is a profound human being. He is literally spending his entire life trying to save all of us. And he's doing it swimming upriver, upstream. Because you go into rooms like this, I assure you, there are people in here right now who think I'm full of shit. There are. Probably a third of the room. Okay? It turns out I'm right. Okay? And, and I, they may think I'm full of shit, but I am right. I am right. So are you going to become Tesla? Are you going to become Amazon? No. So that's one of the problems is, well, man, digital transformation makes sense for those big companies. But how would it make sense for us little guys, the, the medium-sized mom-and-pop manufacturer? Tesla and, and Amazon are awesome because data is their primary commodity. They're focused on making products that get better after you buy them. That should be a big one. You guys, should, you should start, the, the bell should be going off in your head. They predict and solve problems. How many of you just spend all day reacting to issues? Actually, all of you. Okay. Let's, let's be honest. You have a Bay of meetings. You're responding to issues. The most elite organizations in the world predict their problems. They know, they know it. it's going to happen 60 days before it happens. You know that Tesla knows how many cars they're going to produce 60 days in the future. Has anybody been to a gigafactory? Okay, so I want, I want to encourage you to fly to Austin and sign up for a tour of the gigafactory. You work in manufacturing, walk from one side to the other, and when you come out on the other side of the facility, let's say you're in automotive, the first thing you're gonna say is, we're out of business, I should find a different job. But if you work in manufacturing, you will walk out the other side of that factory with your mind blown. You want to know why? How many of you here struggle hiring young people? Retaining. Recruiting and retaining young people. All of you. Okay? I'm Gen X, so I was born in 1974. So when I went into the workforce, do you know what the turnover rate was for my generation at one year in manufacturing? So that is, if I got a job in manufacturing, well, how many of us turned over by the end of the 12 months? It was 11%. So my generation kept that job 89% of the time. Do you know what it is today? You should know. At the six month mark, it is 53%. So Gen Zs and millennials turn over 53% of the time at the six month mark. Why? Come on, you guys kinda know why. They don't like it. No, they don't like it. They're not empowered. They're not empowered. 
This is a generation of kids who've solved their own problems their whole life. Their whole life. They were born with technology in their lap. I have three sons, 15, 19, and 24. Two of my boys are here with me. Do you know how often my sons ask me to help them solve a problem? Never. When I was 21, I called my dad four times a week. How do I fix the dryer? Dad, the faucet's linking. Um, I don't know how to, which wads I need to buy to reload my shotgun shell. My kids don't do any of that stuff. Why? Right. They've had access to all of human knowledge through one single pane of glass their entire lives. They work on big problems. How many of you think young people are lazy, entitled, um, what's the other word they always say for Gen Z and millennial? Lazy, entitled, um, you know, too, uh, you know, virtue signal too much. How many of you guys think that? I do not think that. What I think is young people are far smarter than we were at 18 or 19 years old. Much smarter. They may not be as savvy, and they may not have as much life experience, but they are far smarter than we were. Much, I had to start studying to talk to my 15-year-old son when he turned 13. And I mean that. Who here knows what the great filter is? All the young people know what the great filter is, so Google it. Okay. They predict and solve problems using data. And then the last thing, and this is why all of you as small manufacturers must digitally transform, even if you think you don't have to. And the answer is the digital supply chain. Does anybody know what the digital supply chain is? Okay. Digital supply chain, right now you guys are links in a supply chain. Okay, so that is you, you talk to the people you buy from and you talk to the people you sell to. Who do you not talk to? All the people you could potentially buy from and all the people you could potentially sell to. Who does Tesla talk to? Everyone. Everyone in the digital supply chain. Uh, Saint Gobain, everybody familiar with Saint Gobain? Big, large French multinational, right? They are one of the links in the Tesla digital supply chain. St. Cobain supplies the, the glass for the passenger side doors and the driver side doors okay, for all the Tesla cars. What happens if Tesla goes and looks at their digital infrastructure and sees that St. Cobain has, um, they're going to have an inventory issue. They're not going to be able to supply enough windows for my cars. Do they slow down production? No. What do they do? They have another supplier. They have another supplier. And based on demand, they pivot to the other supplier. And there is no disruption to their manufacturing. That's digital supply chain. Digital supply chain is taking your digital infrastructure and plugging it into an ecosystem so that you can communicate with other companies. I'm so digital maturity. The goal here is when you leave, you guys, I want you guys in the next eight weeks to write a digital strategy statement. How are you gonna write a digital strategy statement if you've never had one before? It's real simple, you either call us, you're gonna call Mass MEP, you're gonna call somebody who specializes in doing this. It doesn't cost you anything to call me, it doesn't cost you anything to call Mass MEP. What you do is you engage with people who are experts at helping digitally transform organizations, and you write a digital strategy statement. And you know how we're gonna figure out what your problems are? We're gonna to talk to your operators. We're going to tell the chief executive and the chief technical officer and the chief operating officer that they know nothing about their business. That's what we're going to tell them. If they kick us out of the room, we go to the next guy who gets it. And then we're going to go talk to the operators and we're going to start solving the actual business problems using a digital infrastructure. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Okay? But there are 10 pillars that you need to score yourself on on a scale of 1 to 5. One is operations. One is IT. One is engineering, one is quality, leadership, infrastructure, platform, network, connectivity, and strategy. Do you know who the most digitally mature organization in the world is? It is Tesla. This is an industry 4.0 distribution. There are 1,380 companies that have all been scored on that matrix right here. Okay, this is the, the most updated distribution. You should notice something about this distribution. If you were to look at the one from last year and then look at it today, there's something that would stand out. And that is that the companies who are at the mean in digital maturity and below are dying. 
They're dead. And in fact, they're dead men walking. So what happens now is when a company comes to us and they are one or two standard deviations below the mean, we tell them to start working on their M&A or exit strategy. We don't even engage at all. And that is a hard conversation to have with organizations. And I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to tell you the truth. If you, if you fall in this bottom half, there is no way to save you. No chance, impossible. It is merger, it is acquisition, it is bankruptcy. Three years ago, there was a chance. Five years ago, there was a chance. I've been doing this for eight years, ringing the bell. Today, there's no chance for you. And that's new. That started in November of 2022 when ChatGPT came out. So all the companies who already have digital infrastructures, you know you guys have three of the most advanced technical companies in the world within a four hours drive of you? Tulip is down in Somerville, PTC is in Boston, and Kepware, which is a PTC partner, is based in Portland. Three of the most advanced technological companies in the world. They create solutions for digital companies. And they're right down the street. Yet only 10% of your GDP comes from manufacturing, and only 7% of the people in your state work in manufacturing. Why? It's preposterous. Doesn't that scare anyone? You have all this manufacturing experience and only 7% of the people in the state work in manufacturing? Tesla and Amazon are in the red circle there. Okay? There are 10 companies. If you take the 10 companies who are the 10 most digitally mature companies in the world, this is the most valuable thing I own, and this is why people listen to me. Because I have this 1,380 companies based on that 10 matrix, that 10, 10 pillar matrix. Do you know only one of the companies in the top 10 are a legacy organization? They may know who it is? Volkswagen. Volkswagen North America. That's it. The other nine are emerging companies. That is, they started after the year 2000, when the fourth industrial revolution had already happened. All right. Uh, the big guys, they all do this. Lighthouse projects, Kaikaku. Does everybody know what conti continuous improvement is? All right. During continuous improvement, when you're in a technological revolution, you invest dollars and you get return. Okay? And when you see the return slowing down, you know you're getting to the end of the technological revolution. That's the flattening of the S. And then it requires what is known as groundbreaking innovation. So if you're in lean or you're in Kaizen, say Japanese lean Kaizen, you need Kaikaku, groundbreaking innovation. Same game, new rules. Tesla originally, Tesla originally tried to manufacture cars the way Ford and GM did. And it failed miserably. And then in 2008, right when he only had $25 million left, he went back to the drawing board and he created a whole new plan. And then he said, St. Cobain, if you want to come with us, you've got to change the way you do things. Uh, who, here's the, the new Kodak. Does anybody know who the new Kodak is? This is going to piss some people off, but does anybody know who it is? It's General Electric. GE is a dead company. They're a dead company. Crazy. Jeff Immelt ran GE into the ground with hubris. He believed, he believed he could own the digital infrastructure. This is why I'm hard on Rockwell, by the way. The connected enterprise, the, the, the stack. I love a lot of things about Rockwell, I do. But GE believed that they could own the digital infrastructure instead of joining a digital ecosystem. GE never considered for one moment that they were going to need to connect to other companies that had digital infrastructures. They never considered that for a moment. And that's why their intelligence platform failed. Because they expected their customers to join their intelligence platform. Their suppliers to join their intelligence platform. In fact, every facility we have ever worked with in my entire career, Cargill, Vanguard Printing, New Core Steel, Borg Warner Automotive, which is a tier one automotive supplier in upstate New York, when Magna went away, uh, when Cosmo went away, Borg Warner is still there. Every client we've ever worked with 
has stayed and grown. Okay, the lesson for today is what? Everybody's gonna do what in the next eight weeks? Digital strategy. I'll tell you what it is, it's a three sentence statement. Why we wanna be digital and how data will become our primary commodity. Why we wanna be digital, how data will become our primary commodity. I strongly want to encourage you to leverage MassMEP. They are an organization that requires a zero dollar investment to engage with them to start. Reach out, watch our YouTube content. It's 4.0 Solutions on YouTube. You can go to iot.university. You can talk to many of the people in here who watch our content. I really appreciate you guys, your patience. This was a very important conversation. I hope now you guys are able to answer those three questions just eight weeks from now. Okay, thank you for your time. I get it? All right. How bad did I go over? I went way over? Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. Like, if you go into a manufacturing facility and that manufacturing facility says, you ask, first thing I ask the operator, are you allowed to connect to the Wi Fi with your cell phone? And if they say no, I go, okay, that's a problem, right? Yeah. You know, you need all the safety arguments and stuff, they're all valid. But the point is, you have to figure out a way to be safe and still leverage technology, right? So you have to change the culture. The way you change the culture is to solve the frontline workers' problem where they get used to using digital. Yes. And that's, so we always want the frontline, like we want that leader, but. Yeah. If the leader's not on board, it's not gonna be successful, right. but you need the. But you need the frontline. Yeah. They, they know yeah. what all the problems are. So yeah. you start where the problem is. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. how we operate. You, you gotta start yeah. where the problem is. Yeah. And so you gotta get the problem from them, right? right. They, and it, it also goes into buy-in, right? It, it, you know, you have to change the climate to shift the culture, to become yep. digital, right? Yep. To change the climate, you have to just get people used to digital as a way of life. One of the biggest challenges that we have is like when we go, a client hires us, we go on site to do the kickoff where we're basically doing a lot of what I'm doing in this presentation. Yeah. It's all C-level, it's all middle management, it's all senior management. We're like, whoa, whoa, you guys aren't gonna do this. Right. Like you have to believe in it right. and you have to enable it and you have to set yeah. the strategy, but it's gonna be done on the plant floor. Right. Where are those people? Yeah, Thank you, I appreciate it. So um, I don't know how small you guys are willing to work with, but what my company does is we provide uh, consulting to manufacturing companies in tax and helping them prepare to sell, helping yeah. them prepare to go to their next phase. And I do business valuation on them. And one of the areas we assess is what they're doing to increase productivity. So it's every organization. Mm -hmm. So in fact, our mission is the smaller organization. We use the bigger organizations to subsidize you know, we actually tell the big organizations, hey, we're taking some of the money we make from you. And in and a lot of cases, when we're engaging with smaller companies, we're losing money yeah. or we're doing it pro bono. It's, it's our way of helping smaller men. I mean, my goal is small manufacturing. I mean, I think it's the backbone of America. It's, uh, it literally is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's what 90% of manufacturing are small manufacturers. So our goal is to help as many small manufacturers as we can, right? But we do that through, through a revenue stream created by larger manufacturers. All right, so I just finished up giving the keynote address at Mass MEP and talking to a bunch of members of the community. A lot of people came out. It was actually an incredible experience. Uh, funny story, I found out that the audience was two to 300 uh, small manufacturers. And the message that I want to give to small manufacturers, that is 200 employees or less, is different than the message I prepared to give. So I actually winged my keynote address completely and hit a total home run. Everyone was super excited. Thank you to everybody who came out, everyone who took time to talk to me after I spoke. Um, all of the fellowship, the relationships we've established, to everyone that we said we would follow up with and have a conversation with. I'm looking forward to talking to you soon. Thanks for watching guys, see you in the next one.